He was just imprinted, imprinted with the image of a capable, judicious, uh, vigorous leader. And, and that's the, the kind of man he wanted to be. He wanted to emulate that in his choice, chosen course of life, which turned out to be the law. Right, and, he, and of course, uh, and you talk about this in the book, the, the t tremendous impact, his relationship with Washington, um, uh, the relationship he had with Washington had on his entire life, including what he does on the Supreme Court. As um, a young lawyer, he stays with George Witt, uh, mm -hmm. which turns out to be an inf influential relationship as well. So Witt had taught a few of the framers. Yes, he, um, Witt taught Thomas Jefferson privately. Uh, Marshall encountered him in a course that Witt gave at William and Mary. It was, it was the first course in the law in any American college. And um, must have been a good class, because two, two of Marshall's <laughs> classmates, one was Bushrod Washington, who was one of George's nephews, and would be Marshall's colleague on the Supreme Court for almost 30 years. Mm -hmm. They would serve together close friends, close judicial and intellectual allies. Uh, the third guy in the class was a man named Spencer Roan, who would end up being um, the Chief Justice in Virginia's Court of Appeals and a thorn in Mar Marshall's side for many, many years. A Jeffersonian uh, had as low an opinion of Marshall as Jefferson did and vice versa. Well, we could think of this as a tree that has many branches. As a law professor, I'm going to drop a quick footnote here. Another student down the road is going to be a guy named Henry Clay, Henry Clay. who will, of course, that story will come later. <laughs> um, but in terms of the Marshall's life, um, he also, uh, based on the relationship he had with Washington and his strong convictions in the Constitution, ends up uh, participating in the ratification campaign as well. That's right. Um, he, he serves under Washington in the war. And then he serves under Washington again in the ratification struggle. Uh, he's not eminent enough to be sent to Philadelphia as a delegate to the Constitutional Convention, but he gets elected to the Virginia Ratifying Convention, where he's uh, strongly in the party that's in favor of ratification. And he gives a couple of speeches, one of them on the judiciary, mm -hmm. which, which forecasts a lot of what he will later do. I, I would call him a strong middle-ranking player in that fight at the Virginia Convention. Yes, and, and ultimately a strong Federalist. Yes, uh, yes. When, when America gets its, its first two-party system, you mentioned this, um, uh, talking about the election of 1800, it's the Federalists, which is the party of George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, John Adams, and also John Marshall. And one interesting thing about John Marshall, because the Federalists fell apart um, before and after the election of 1800. They never took back the White House. They never gained a majority in, in either House of Congress. And then after the War of 1812, they just disappeared. And like a lot of parties when they're on the ropes, they fought among themselves. <laughs> you know, as you're going down, you, you, you fight with your supposed friends and allies. Uh, and it got pretty acrid. If, if you've seen the Hamilton show, you, you know how Hamilton and John Adams went at it. They covered that in one episode. But Marshall manages to remain friends with all these guys as his party is falling apart. I mean, Federalists who have come to despise each other, but Marshall manages to, be, to stay on good terms with all of them. And I think th that reflects something very important about his personality. This is a guy who's genial. He doesn't have rough edges. You know, I'm always leaving Jefferson aside, but he likes everybody and everybody likes him. Uh, he has high spirits. He has a good sense of humor. He likes a good drink. He drinks a lot. <laughs> he drinks a lot with his friends and his <laughs> colleagues. Uh, I have to tell you one story about Marshall when he gets on the Supreme Court. Uh, the court had already been up and running 11 years before he becomes Chief Justice. And they had several customs they'd already developed. And one was when the justices were deliberating, they, they would come to uh, Philadelphia or New York or Philadelphia or Washington, wherever the national capital was. And uh, at first they had two sessions per year, then this was cut back to one. So they would be in the Capitol for several weeks at a stretch, rooming in the same boarding house, and they'd hear 
the cases and the lawyers arguing during the day, and then they'd go back and they'd have dinner together and they'd, they'd discuss what, what they had heard. And their rule became that they could never, they couldn't have wine at dinner or at these discussions unless it was raining outside. <laughs> and I assume that was to cheer them up. So Marshall's universal custom was to ask one of his colleagues, often just a story, Brother Story, will you look out the window and tell us what the weather is? <laughs> and the story might say, well, the sky, you know, perfectly clear. And Marshall would say, our jurisdiction is so vast that by the law of chances, <laughs> it must be raining somewhere. <laughs> so wine was always served at the Marshall Court. Right. Um, I don't know how and, that tracks current practice. No, uh, I'm sure that in current practice, people want to drink a lot still. <laughs> um, but, um, and the reasons vary over time. Uh, but uh, I want to cover at least one other thing about Marshall's life before we get him to the Supreme Court, which of course is going to be an, an immensely important event for the, uh, for the history of this country. Partly because of his relationship with Washington, partly because he's a rather adept lawyer, Washington wants to bring him back to Washington, or at least bring him back to the nation's capital, bring him back to, um, to work in the government. Marshall resists, but if he does come back at least once uh, well, under Washington. Yes, the, the, the final appeal, and this is after Washington is president. It's during the administration of John Adams. And, and George Washington, by this time, has become a Federalist partisan. I, I think he resisted choosing a party as long as he could, but by this point, he's a partisan Federalist. And he thinks the Federalist Party needs bucking up in Virginia. So he summons two people to come to Mount Vernon. John Marshall, his former junior officer, and his nephew, Bushrod Washington. And he basically reads them a lecture, and he says, you, 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 you two have to run for Congress. You've got to do it. And Marshall doesn't want to. He wants to make money. I mean, he's a lawyer. He's, he's a good lawyer. He's doing very well. Uh, and he has a family, and he's also buying land. So he needs money. He needs to make money. But Washington is just Adam and Adam and Adam. And the, the story is that Marshall decided, I, you know, I can't keep saying no. I've got to get up at the crack of dawn and get out of here. But Washington had gotten up first and put on his uniform. <laughs> so, you know, made one more appeal. That's the story. What, what we do know, in Marshall himself wrote, that I yielded to this representation. As Washington told him, look, I left Mount Vernon to fight the Revolutionary War, and now I'm going to lead it again in case France invades. There was a fear that we'd go to war with France, and Washington had agreed to be the commander-in-chief in case it came to that. So here's John Marshall being told by the father of his country, look, I'm doing this. You've got to do it. So, and the consequences are enormous because he runs for Congress, he wins, and then from the Congress, he is picked by John Adams to be Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is when Adams is cleaning the Hamilton loyalists out of his cabinet. So um, the Secretary of State gets fired, Marshall becomes the new one. Then, tail end of the Adams administration, the current Chief Justice, third man to hold that post, Oliver Ellsworth, writes the President and tells him, uh, my health is bad, you know, I have gout, I, I just don't want to do this anymore. So there's a vacancy and they've got to fill it before Jefferson comes in. So uh, Adams offers it to the, the man who was the first Chief Justice, John Jay. He'd been Chief Justice for six years, and then he'd stepped down to run for Governor of New York, and he was ending his second term as Governor of New York. Adams sends his name to the Senate, the Senate confirms him, then he gets a letter from Jay saying, I decline the offer. And he says, the, the job doesn't have dignity. I'm not going to do this again. And so, uh, as Marshall describes it, he's sitting in the still unfinished White House in Adams's office. The, the, the exterior shell is there, but the whole building is like a construction site. And they're sitting in the Oval Office, and Adams says to him, who shall I nominate now? And Marshall says, I don't know, sir. And Adams thinks for a bit and says, I believe I'll nominate you. So that's how John Marshall got the nomination. Senate confirmed him. And he was off for the next 34 years of his life. Yes, he was. And so, as, and as you point out in the book, it wasn't an immediately quick confirmation, though. 
To, to there was some, you know, there was some resistance because as a congressman, Marshall hadn't been a completely hardcore federalist. Uh, he, for instance, he said of the Alien and Sedition Acts, uh, I would prefer to just let them lapse. You know, and if you were a real hardcore federalist, you, you didn't want to give an inch on that. So there was some head scratching in the Federalist Senate caucus, but they knew time was running out too, and they, they confirmed it. Yes, and, and so he finds himself the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, the last Federalist ever appointed to the court. Um, and as time goes by, and we'll go through this, the court's going to change, of course. Um, and most of the people that come to the court are not going to be Federalists. They're, uh, they're going to the, be people that often appointed by presidents who didn't like John well, Marshall. Well, that's right. I mean, the next three presidents, and they're each going to serve two terms, it's going to be three Virginia Republicans. Jefferson for eight years, Madison for eight, Monroe for eight. And after only 11 years, the, the balance on the court goes from six Federalists, and then people die and retire, and it's two Federalists and five Republicans. They, they've increased the size of the court by one. So Jefferson and Madison fill all those vacancies, and they, they fill them with Republicans. But uh, the, the surprising thing is that Marshall herds all these cats. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, issues decisions. Often they're unanimous. Often they're written by the Chief Justice. And these Republican appointed justices go along with his decision making. And I think there are you know, a number of reasons for that if, if we want to uh, get into them now. It may be helpful to get into them a little bit, although I also want to get into some of the cases sure. too. Um, uh, and maybe it'll, uh, we can kind of weave them in and out uh, or together. Um, Mar Marshall has a series of cases um, that are important. The first of which, of course, is a little case called Marbury versus Madison. Mm -hmm. What happens there? Well, Marbury versus Madison is, is famous because it is the first time that the Supreme Court rules a portion of a law passed by Congress unconstitutional. And I want to, you know, dissent a little from the popular understanding that is important, but I don't think that was the startling thing about Marbury at the time. The notion of judicial review was already out there. Um, Hamilton had written about this in the Federalist Papers in 1788. Marshall himself had spoken about it at the Virginia Ratifying Convention. Uh, his enemy, Spencer Roan, who would you know, hate the federal judiciary, but as a Virginia judge, he would use uh, judicial review with respect to Virginia laws mm -hmm. all the time. So this was, this was a concept that people were already familiar with. What I think was so striking about the uh, Marbury decision was that it's a long decision, it's 9,000 words, and about 8,500 words of it are a lecture to the Jefferson administration telling it, you people have behaved badly. You know, you've, you've come in, you've, you've said, uh, oh, the Federalists, they, they were uh, anti-Republican, uh, they passed on constitutional laws. We're going to do things differently. But look what you've done. You're doing the same thing. Now, what have they done? William Marbury was a Federalist in the District of Columbia. Uh, one of the lame duck acts that John Adams took is he appointed 40-some justices of the peace in the district, which, which is something the president had the power to do. It's a minor post, but it was a little patronage job. Uh, in the rush to finish the Adams administration, not all of these commissions had been delivered. Uh, and Marbury's was one of the ones that hadn't. It was still sitting on a, on a desk when Jefferson and his new team came in. And their attitude was, well, we're not going to be the delivery boys for the Adams administration. If they, didn't, you know, if they didn't get these commissions to their holders, that's too bad. We're, we're not going to do the job for them. So uh, Marbury sues to get his commission. He goes to court to get his commission. And what he asks is, is that the court issue what is called a writ of mandamus to the Secretary of State, who's James Madison. And this is a writ that, that you know, commands lower courts or, or people to, to do a certain thing. Mandamus is Latin for, uh, for a command. 
Okay, so, so that is the case. When it, when it finally uh, is, is decided by the Supreme Court, Marshall reads this immensely long decision. It takes him a couple of hours uh, to read it. And he starts off by saying, uh, Marbury has a right. He has a right to his commission. This commission was signed, sealed, approved, and at that moment, it should go into effect. It doesn't matter if it didn't, if it didn't get handed to him, wouldn't matter if it had been dropped on the way. It, it was done at the moment it was finally signed and sealed. So Marbury has a right to it. Second point, Marbury has a remedy. If you have a right to something under the American system, you can, you can get a remedy which will restore that right to you by going to the courts, by going to court, point number two. Then the third point is the writ of mandamus, the proper remedy. And there, Marshall, he, 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 he looks at the Judiciary Act of 1789, which set the federal judiciary system up, and which gave the Supreme Court, among other things, the power to issue writs of mandamus. And this is how Marbury is asking for his commission. And what Marshall uh, decides is now a writ of mandamus is an act of original jurisdiction. You know, that's something that happens when a trial is brand new. When it first appears in court, this is like discovery. This is something that happens at the first stage of a trial. Okay, so it's an act of original jurisdiction. But, says John Marshall, reading the Constitution, the court does not have original jurisdiction over cases involving the Secretary of State persons in office, which is what James Madison is. It has original jurisdiction over cases involving ambassadors, diplomats, and there's some other categories of people. But, but the, the relevant distinction is James Madison is not a diplomat. He doesn't represent a foreign power. He's a person in the United States government. The court doesn't have this power to require him to do something. So therefore, William Marbury can't get his commission this way. So, on the substance of it, it's a defeat for federalism, right? This loyal federalist can't get his patronage job, and it also strips from the Supreme Court a power to issue a writ of mandamus, because, says Marshall, it's unconstitutional for the court to have this power in this case. But the big victory for him politically is that he spent most of this 9,000-word opinion scolding the Jefferson administration. And the headline in Alexander uh, Hamilton's New York Post is, um, it was some, something like, uh, uh, Jefferson administration um, defies the Constitution. So Hamilton, Hamilton got the point. And of course, the rest of the story is judicial review. The fact that the court then, um, Marshall reaffirms the fact that the court has this great power to review the constitutionality of, mm -hmm. of federal laws. It also has the power to review the constitutionality of some state laws. Yes, oh yes, he does that a lot. He only does this thing once, yes. uh, and it doesn't get done again until the Dred Scott decision. But uh, he reviews a lot of state laws, shoots a lot of them down, yes. and the states are not happy. Yeah, the states are not happy. And, and so I want to go look at one of those cases, Fletcher versus Peck, because it involves something that's real important, is it, as you write about with Marshall, the contracts clause. Mm -hmm. Well, Fle okay, Fletcher versus Peck has to do with a, a land deal, a sale that the state of Georgia made. Uh, in the 1790s, uh, Georgia was broke. It was probably the poorest of the original 13 states. But they had a lot of land because Georgia uh, originally stretched all the way to the Mississippi. It, it em encompassed what's now Alabama and Mississippi. So Georgia thinks we can sell off all this land, we can balance our books. So they sell 35 million acres for half a million dollars. It's a penny and a half an acre. Every legislator in the Georgia legislature got $1,000 for approving this sale. Excuse me, there was one man who took only 600. He said, I wasn't greedy. <laughs> so that, that was the going rate. Um, and then, the, of course, the point, the original sellers are not going to move to any of this land. They're going to flip it. This has been going on in America forever, you know, real estate madness. And, and that's what happens. The original sellers, they flip their purchases uh, to other speculators who hope to resell at higher rates themselves. But there's, there's 
anger in Georgia at this deal. It, it looks corrupt, and, and indeed it was. So a new set of legislators is elected. They issue a repeal act which says that the sale was invalid and we will not recognize it in any Georgia court. Any Georgia official who behaves as if this sale were real will be fined $1,000, which is a considerable sum of money. So they say we repeal the sale and we're, we're just going to squelch it in any Georgia court. Uh, so the purchasers, they go to Alexander Hamilton for a legal opinion. Hamilton is now in private life, private practice as a lawyer. And he writes them a little 500-word opinion where he says, uh, well, you know, for legislatures to take back a law like this is uh, both impractical and unjust, but it's also in violation of Article I, Section 10 of the Constitution, which forbids states from impairing the obligation of contract. This is known as the contract clause. And Hamilton was pretty familiar with that clause because he's probably responsible for sticking it in the Constitution. It only appears in the very last draft which came out of the Committee of Style on which he sat, okay, at, at, the, at the very end of the Constitutional Convention. So this is Hamilton's opinion, um, 1796. Well, this, uh, this sale, uh, it, gets, it gets tangled up in Congress, the Jefferson administration, um, cobbles together a compromise where they will, they'll compensate the purchasers, they'll compensate the state of Georgia. All they have to do is get Congress to sign off. Congress balks. Uh, there are people in Jefferson's own party who don't, who don't want to do this compromise. They think that, that um, brings the taint of this original sale on themselves, and they refuse to do it. So the purchasers go to, go to court. Now, how, how are they going to do that? They can't go to a Georgia court, because Georgia has said, we will not recognize any suits about this in our own court. Uh, they, the state of Georgia cannot be sued by non-Georgians because of the 11th Amendment. This was an amendment passed after, in the 1790s, there had been a Supreme Court case, Chisholm v. Georgia, and uh, after Georgia was successfully sued in that case, it took two years to pass the 11th Amendment, record time, which said that states cannot be sued by citizens of other states. So that's, that's a check there. So what happens is that two citizens of different states get involved in a lawsuit. Robert Fletcher of New Hampshire sues John Peck of Massachusetts. Peck sold Fletcher some Georgia land. In other words, uh, Peck had purchased it, and then he'd resold it to Fletcher. Fletcher takes him to court saying, you didn't have the right to own this land in the first place because Georgia has annulled the sale. I want my money back. I paid you $3,000 for this land. I want my money back. So they go to court. The case comes up to the Supreme Court. It's Fletcher versus Peck. And, and it gets to the Supreme Court because it's two citizens of two different states, neither of them Georgia, suing each other over land arising from this sale. And Marshall's decision tracks Hamilton's legal opinion of 1796. Uh, he says it is impractical and unjust for a legislature to take back a sale that it has made. Uh, he says, the past cannot be recalled by the most absolute power. But then he says, there's a larger point, which is that Georgia is part of a great empire. It is part of the United States, which has a constitution. And that constitution has Article I, Section 10, which says that no state may impair the obligation of contracts. And this Georgia land sale was a contract. And therefore, Georgia cannot take it back. And Marshall, I, th I think, audaciously, he says, this is a bill of rights for the people of every state. Now, you know, what do we think of the Bill of Rights as? We think of the first 10 amendments, you know, freedom of speech, no establishment of religion, keep and bear arms, no unreasonable search and seizures. Marshall is saying the Bill of Rights in the Constitution is Article I, Section 10, 
which forbids states from impairing the obligation of contracts. That is how important he thinks contracts are. And he thinks that because in his opinion, America after the revolution and before the constitution was passed in that five to six year gap was just a chaos of bad legislation. States were passing laws right and left, often contradictory laws. They would make deals and then they would take them back. They would say that debts don't have to be collected when they're due, or maybe you can have a grace period before you have to pay, or maybe you don't have to pay the full amount. We'll knock it down to like X percent of it. Uh, it was all this interference with, with the arrangements that pe the economic arrangements that people had made. And Marshall uh, thought that it destroyed confidence between men and men. You know, he wants it made crystal clear that if you make a deal, there it is in black and white. If you sign a contract, you're bound by it. And, and I think that's the importance of Fletcher versus Peck. Yes, it's one of the seminal cases. Of course, there are lots of seminal cases that Marshall's a part of. Um, and we're going to go back and forth between cases and also some of the people that Marshall ends up serving with. So mm -hmm. as, um, and this is going to be roughly chronological, not maybe perfectly chronological. But along the way, um, one of the most interesting people, I think, although there are a lot of interesting people Marshall work, works with on the court, but one of the most interesting people ends up being a Madisonian appointment. Mm -hmm. uh, Joseph Story. Joseph Story ends up being really the third choice for um, Madison to fill a seat that opens up. Um, tell us a little bit about Joseph Story and, and his interaction with Marshall. Right, well, Joseph Story first comes into Marshall's uh, purview because he, he's one of the lawyers in Fletcher versus Peck. Right. He, is, he is arguing the validity of the Georgia, the original sale. In other words, he's arguing for the land speculators. That's what he's doing. And yet, he, he is a member of the Republican Party, of Jefferson's party. Uh, he's a young man. He's very intelligent. Uh, he's read everything. Um, he seems to know, <laughs> to know everything. Uh, he writes about everything that he knows very fluently. Uh, I, you know, you'll like him. He's a gregarious guy. Um, I think he could wear you out. <laughs> Maybe because he loves to, to write and he loves to talk. But he and Marshall just hit it off. There's a 24-year uh, age gap. Uh, all, another factor here is that Marshall has a number of sons, but num none of them are anywhere near as intelligent as he is. So I think Story kind of fills a gap in his life there. And their intelligence is different. I mean, Story is like, he's always like right there, you know, saying something effervescent quick on the draw. Marshall is a little slower to get going. I mean, you know, he's a lot of fun, but he doesn't really engage himself readily. But when he does, it's almost implacable. I mean, the force of his mind when it gets going is like a, there aren't locomotives yet, but that's what it's like. It's like a train bearing <laughs> down. So they kind of complement each other. And as I said, Story is the one he always asks to look out the window and see uh, see what the weather uh, was. Now that accidentally relates to a conversation that Story had with Thomas Jefferson. When Story gets his domination, Jefferson of course is no longer president, but he still follows politics. And he's a little worried about Joseph Story because Story, <laughs> he is a Republican, but he seems unorthodox in certain ways. And so he wants to warn Story about the Marshall Court and about Chief Justice Marshall. And he tells him, if Marshall asks you a question, never answer it. <laughs> never answer it. If he asked me, is the sun shining? I would say, I don't know, sir. I cannot tell. You know, and, and Jefferson's fear is that if you said, yes, the sun shining, Marshall would get Marbury versus Madison out of that somehow. You know, he, that his mind is so, so, uh, nimble and sophistical, it would twist anything you say into what Marshall wants to say. And I guess the proof of that is that the story becomes Marshall's great yes. admirer, partner, right. defender. Becomes um, a great Supreme Court justice in his own right. Yes, after, um, after Marshall and, died. And uh, 
Marshall hoped he would succeed him as Chief Justice, and because of the politics of the 1830s, that doesn't work. Uh, Story will dedicate his wonderful commentaries on the Constitution to, of all people, John Marshall. So he doesn't really realize Madison's hope that he can become a check on Marshall. Uh, but he also ends up writing perhaps one of the most important opinions the court ever renders in a case that Marshall doesn't participate in. Oh, Martin uh, Mar versus Hunter's Lessee. Right. Uh, this, is, this involves uh, a struggle over a land grant in Colonial and then in the state of Virginia that went on for decades. Uh, there was a noble English family, the Fairfaxes, that were given, that had a grant of land in the state of Virginia that was as big as New Jersey. Now it's big. Um, uh, among the people they hired to help them survey it were George Washington and John Marshall's father. So they, both these men had connections with the, the Fairfax family. And then, you know, after the revolution, uh, the, the heir of this grant, he doesn't want to come to America to tend it, so he, he, um, he's willing to sell it off, and among the purchasers are John Marshall, his brother James, and a brother-in-law. There's like a Marshall clan syndicate <laughs> that wants to buy a big chunk of this grant. This is a decades-long process because there are counterclaims on the same land. They have to get the state of Virginia to sign off on this process. It, it's legal. It's political. It's just a big ball of wax. And the suit that, that you're referring to involved a portion of this grant in the Shenandoah Valley that, that James Marshall had. It was like only 780 acres, which I guess in Virginia is just like you know your corner plot or something. <laughs> but uh, it gets to, the, and the reason this is so important is that Virginia refused to acknowledge the right of anyone to appeal a state's court decision to the Supreme Court. They said we should be the last mm -hmm. level of appeal on this. And they, they refused even to appear before the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Now Marshall recused himself from this case be, because of his brother's involvement in it, although he did, you know, he did work with Story on his own. own and I've even seen an argument that he ghosted Story's opinion, which I, I, Joseph Story didn't have to have anyone ghost anything for him. He, he could write it, but he certainly agreed, agreed with it. And Story very ringingly said, yes, uh, appeals can be made beyond the state level to the federal courts. Yes, and Martin versus Henry, I see such an important opinion. Justice Holmes later says, Marbury isn't necessarily all that important. The Republic would have survived perhaps without that opinion, but might not have survived without Martin versus Henry's Lessee, which a case in which the court rec recognizes its power to review a state court opinion that involves a question of federal power, uh -huh. federal law. Um, Story and Marshall together will sit for a while, decades. Um, they'll also have a chance to sit on a very important case involving an institution that is located not too far from here, the National Bank. Uh -huh. This is a case called McCulloch versus Maryland. Right, and that's um, the decision in that case, and this is a, a John Marshall decision. Uh, one element of it is the old question going back to the Washington administration. Is a national bank constitutional? Because it is not an enumerated power. The Constitution says nothing about a national bank nothing about the federal government's power to set up corporations. Hamilton wants a national bank, and he says, well, the last of the enumerated powers is um, any, anything necessary and proper to carry out the previous list. And of that list, there are many things that a national bank would facilitate. Therefore, it's constitutional. It's also not prohibited. You know, there's nothing in the Constitution that says you must not do this. So since it would be helpful to powers that are enumerated and it's not prohibited, therefore, says Hamilton, it's constitutional. Uh, James Madison and Thomas Jefferson gave negative opinions at the time. Washington agreed with Hamilton. So there was a first bank of the United States here in Philadelphia that lasted for 20 years. And then... Uh, it, it was not rechartered in 1811, and then after the War of 1812, the second bank was chartered also in Philadelphia in 1816. Now, um, state, states had their own banks, and they didn't like competition. 
So a lot of states, they either had laws that said no bank from out of state can operate in our state, or they said any bank from out of state will tax it. Now, some of these taxes were punitive. They were designed to destroy the operations of any out-of-state bank. Ohio had a tax of $50,000 a year, which was big then. Maryland had a smaller one, $15,000 a year. That was for revenue raising. They didn't want to necessarily keep it out. They just wanted to make money off it. But um, the Second Bank of the United States didn't want to pay it, and they felt you know, they were a federal, federally chartered institution, and, and they shouldn't have to. So uh, this was actually an arranged case. Maryland and the Second Bank agreed to take this to court, and a clerk in the, um, in the bank, a man named uh, James McCullough, he, he paid out a note to one of the directors, and of course they hadn't paid the $15,000 a year you know, fee, so Maryland took them to court. Uh, they were found guilty, uh, and it came up to the Supreme Court. So uh, in the first part of the decision, uh, Marshall says that he agrees with Hamilton that uh, to, to found a bank uh, is constitutional uh, because uh, it does fall under the necessary and proper clause, and it's not forbidden. And then he also says that he, he agrees with the council uh, for the bank, a man named Daniel Webster, who said that the power to tax is the power to destroy. And Marshall uh, agrees with that. Uh, he says states cannot tax portions or entities of the federal government. Uh, and the federal government has supremacy in its operations. If the federal government has a power to do something, its power to do that thing is supreme and it overrides any state prohibition to the contrary. So those were the, you know, the first half of it is kind of settling old business from the Washington administration, but the second half of it is making a very sweeping point. And obviously as Marshall's career as Chief Justice unfolds and he decides these different cases, each of these different monumental cases involves different parts of the Constitution that Marshall really has a chance um, to look at for the first time. Necessary and proper clause in one case, contracts clause in another case, and of course another big case that's gonna come up involves the interstate commerce clause. Oh yes, Gibbons yes. versus Ogden. I love the backstory on this case. This has a great, you know, one of the fun things about writing this book is, is I treated each of these cases as a short story. Because that's really what they are. They, you know, they come to Marshall at the end but there's all this history behind them. You have all these Americans doing the different things they do and getting into arguments and tangles and going to court. And then, you know, and then it rises to the Supreme Court and Marshall gets to say yay or nay. But there's all this you know, activity at the lower level. So Gibbons versus Ogden arises out of a monopoly that Robert Livingston and Robert Fulton have been granted by the state of New York to run steamboats in New York waters. Fulton was one of the inventors. He invented a steamboat. There were other men who'd invented different ones, but he, his steamboat got backed by Robert Livingston, who was a wealthy, politically connected New Yorker. And uh, so not only does he have a boat, Livingston gets the state of New York to say for 30 years, only, only these boats can go up and down the Hudson. Now, of course, they're immediately challenged. <laughs> You know, other people want to sail in New York, and they get taken to court, and it goes back and forth. Uh, the courts in the state of New York uphold the monopoly. One thing the monopoly does is it buys off competitors. There's one set of competitors in Albany, and the monopoly says, all right, we'll let you have Lake Champlain, but we'll keep the Hudson, Hudson River. <laughs> Uh, another competitor appears in New Jersey, Aaron Ogden. He's trying to run boats from Elizabeth, New Jersey into Staten Island. And they go to court, and then finally they agree. Ogden agrees to be a licensee of the monopoly. He'll pay them $600 a year, and they'll let him run his boat. Then Ogden takes on a partner, Thomas Gibbons. And uh, that seems to work for a year. But then there's a problem in the Gibbons family. Gibbons has a daughter, and rumor gets around that she slept with her fiancé. Gibbons wants his entire family to join him in signing an ad in the newspapers saying that this is not true. <laughs> Apparently it was true. 
Aaron Ogden thinks this is a bad idea. Gibbons is so enraged by Ogden's opinion, he shows up at Ogden's house with a horsewhip. Ogden escapes out the back door and sues Gibbons for trespass. This is the end of the partnership. <laughs> so now, now Gibbons goes to war, and he hires a Staten Island ferry boat man named Cornelius Vanderbilt to run his boats. Vanderbilt has no education, but he's a smart guy. He loves this. He builds himself a secret cabin inside Gibbons' boats, so a secret room, so that when the cops come on board, he can be hidden in there, and they won't be able to serve a warrant on him. <laughs> and it's just cat and mouse, you know, in New York Harbor, and he's having a lot of fun. But the other thing he's, Gibbons tells him to do, he says, you go to Washington and hire for me Daniel Webster to argue this case before the Supreme Court. So this is how Daniel Webster becomes the lawyer for, uh, for Gibbons. Uh, the case comes up to the Supreme Court. The question is, can a state have a monopoly on Congress, uh, on commerce, even when con Congress has not acted? Uh, Congress has not passed any laws having to do with steamboats or where they can or can't sail. But the argument that Webster makes is, that doesn't matter. Commerce is something that is a national activity. He, he says it's e pluribus unum. That describes commerce in the United States. And that means that the only power to regulate it rests with Congress, even if Congress hasn't used it. Even if Congress hasn't used it. The other side in the case is saying, well, fine, if Congress passes a law, of course, we'll obey it, but until then, our monopoly ought to be able to operate. So the decision that Marshall makes is, I, I think you'll agree, it's kind of interesting. It's, it's a little odd about the shape of it. He, he basically repeats Webster's argument. And he says, this is a very powerful argument. I'm not sure that it's been refuted. But he decides the case on a relatively minor point, which is that Gibbons's boat had a coasting license issued by the federal government. And this was just a, a piece of paper for revenue ID. It proved you weren't a foreign ship. You know, if you were a foreign ship, you'd have to pay certain duties. But you say, here's, here's my coasting license. I'm an American ship. And Marshall says, a license is a permission to do that thing. Right? If you have a license to coast up and down the coast, that means you can do it. That means you can go from Elizabeth, New Jersey into Staten Island. Mm -hmm. So on that basis, he strikes down the monopoly. Uh, and I think opens the door to larger interpretations of the Commerce Clause. And certainly it helps steamboat commerce. I think the figure is like the number of steamboats in New York Harbor jumped from six to 46. You know, because the competitors were just waiting and they, they brought their boats in. Marshall breathes life into the Interstate Commerce Clause, which is the source of most federal laws today. Mm -hmm. um, we have time for a couple more questions. I want to take, at least ask one sure. from the audience, and I'll just read it uh, as it's written here. Which of Marshall's personal and intellectual qualities made him so effective on the, the court, uh, which were the most challenging in that regard? Well, like I said, he was hurting all these cats, these judges who, you know, justices who, who didn't necessarily agree with him, and yet they ended up agreeing with him. How do you do that? I mentioned his geniality. I mentioned his drinking. <laughs> I mentioned his mind, you know, the power of his mind. But I think another thing, very important, is his deference. He was a collegial man. If there were areas of law that he was not familiar with, he would defer to justices who were expert. Uh, one, one area was land titles. There was a lot of litigation about land titles, particularly arising in Kentucky, because land ownership was very complicated there. Lots of lawsuits. And Marshall would defer, uh, there was a Justice Todd was his colleague from Kentucky, so he deferred to him on that. Uh, he deferred to story on admiralty law. And you know, if you do that, you can get deference in return. 
I mean, it's, it's a virtuous thing to do, and it also pays off. <laughs> and, and so, you know, you combine all these things as natural good humor. People like being around them. He liked people. Uh, he was always the smartest man in the room. And he wasn't arrogant. And I think the, the combination of those factors made him a great leader. Right. In fact, the combination of those factors make him the one person referred to as the great chief, the great chief justice. Um, the only person um, who's referred to in that regard, and also the longest serving mm -hmm. chief justice in American history. Bring us to his last case. Uh, Baron v. Baltimore? Yes. Baron v. Baltimore. Yeah, this is a short decision. It's only, what, like 1,500 words? Very short. And uh, it involves silt and the Bill of Rights. Uh, <laughs> Baron is an owner of a wharf in Baltimore Harbor and at a place called Fells Point. And after he bought his wharf, Baltimore decided to improve Fells Point. They, they cleared land, they laid down streets, they diverted streams that ran into the harbor there. And as a result, there was this silt build up by Barron's Wharf such that no ship could dock there. Destroyed the value of the wharf. Uh, the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution says that um, you know, property may not be taken without compensation. So uh, Barron and his, his partners and backers, they, they go to court saying that you know, our property has been taken, it's been destroyed, we, we didn't get any compensation. And this case comes to the Supreme Court, it's a very brief decision, and Marshall says, well, yes, that is the Fifth Amendment, but that only applies to the federal government, it does not apply to the states. You know, you're not suing the federal government about this. You're, you're suing the city of Baltimore and, and the state of Maryland. So, too bad. Um, the federal government, uh, the, the Fifth Amendment does not apply to a case of this kind. And what, what interested me in writing about that is there was, there was a, um, a legal commentator, mm -hmm. his name was Rawl, who had written a book of, you know, legal commentary on the Constitution, and he said that those parts of the Bill of Rights which do not specifically invoke the federal uh, government do also apply to the states. But Marshall just sweeps that argument aside. Right. He doesn't accept that argument in that case, and ultimately uh, the, the 14th Amendment will become the vehicle that ends up being used to apply the Bill of Rights. To many the decades later. Many, I mean, many, in the, in the yeah. 20th century. Long, long and after. And there, there's still, I mean, there's a case coming up this term. I saw Tim versus Indiana, which involves the Eighth Amendment. So it's not like the court said, okay, all ten apply no. to the states. I mean, it's been a very they did piecemeal, it case by case. Yeah, They've thing. applied most of the Bill of Rights to the states. And uh, as you point out, they're still trying to figure out which ones would apply. The Second Amendment just recently. Mm -hmm. was applied to the states through the 14th, through the 14th Amendment. Um, in the last chapter, you talk about his legacy. Share with us some of the thoughts on his legacy. Well, his successor as Chief Justice is, is Roger Tawney, who I, I think is, holds the record for the second longest tenure, correct? Marshall's 34 years and Tawney's like 27 <clears throat> or 28 yes. years. So he's in there for a long time. And uh, apparently Tawney was... Uh, respected as a legal mind. Mm -hmm. um, his temperament was described as gentle. I think people liked him, liked to work with him. Mm -hmm. But he's, he's infamous for a decision he issues in 1857, which is the Dred Scott decision. And uh, there he says uh, that, that um, well, he overturns the Missouri Compromise saying that uh, the federal government had no right to restrict property in slaves and territories. Uh, he also, uh, in, the, in the course of this decision, it's an immense decision, long, long decision. Uh, he says that because uh, black people were not considered, uh, it was not thought possible that they could be citizens at the time that the Declaration was written or the Constitution was written, therefore Dred Scott cannot bring a suit in court. Uh, one of the dissents in this uh, decision by Justice Curtis said 
Well, actually, in five states, when the Constitution was being ratified, free blacks could vote. And so they probably did vote on whether the Constitution should be ratified or not. So it's inaccurate to say that they were not considered even possible to be citizens where they were free. Uh, this, um, uh, Charles Sumner would call this decision the height of judicial baseness. Uh, so that's, that's, kind of, that's um, not a good look for the Supreme Court. But I think Marshall's tenure had been, it had been so long, so considerable, and so widely respected that the court could recover from this. You know, Marshall had laid down a marker of what the court mm -hmm. could be mm -hmm. and could do, and so it could recover even from a disaster like the Dred Scott decision. And, and I think that's, that's his legacy. He, he, he took this job that John Jay wouldn't take again because he said it had no dignity. And he made it strong enough that even Roger Tawney could not pull it down again. Which is a remarkable legacy. Uh, as you point out in the book, I mean, this is a man who is, again, the longest serving Chief Justice in American history. To give you a sense of the remarkable way in which he wielded the power of Chief Justice over the course of his tenure, he, again, 34 years, he issued all but one dissent. A remarkable fact, given the fact that he served with a number of justices who were appointed by presidents who wanted those justices to go a different direction, but they did But didn't. they really did, they really did. They did not, largely under Marshall. A remarkable legacy. I wish we had more time, we don't. Our guest, Richard Brookheiser, will be here later. Richard's going to be here to sign books afterwards. It's been a great opportunity to visit with one of our favorite guests. Thank you. Thank you. I hope I didn't commit any... Uh...